If you have your Bibles in your in First Corinthians, we'll we'll get there. When it, when it comes to relationships, they're they're dependent, I guess, on on a few things. But one thing is is for sure when you think about the relationships in your life. We all have them in some way, no matter how much of a loner you are, how much of a hermit sometimes it's, it's, it's tempting to be. We all have relationships in our life, and they're dependent on, on a couple things, but, but really one thing that's important is the amount of things that we have in common and the amount of things sometimes that we have uh, different, not, not so much in common. Now, this, this doesn't necessarily just mean numbers. We have, hey, we have five things in common. Uh, so we can be friends because we have only four things that, that, that we disagree on necessarily. But sometimes it's not about the amount. Sometimes it's about the importance, right? One thing may be more important than, uh, than three things we don't have in common. So it's just all about a measuring, measuring scale that we have. Says so this is how our relationships work. They happen in friendships. A lot of things bind us together. Maybe we uh, work at the same place. We, we love the same thing. Sometimes it's just in friendships. You, what do you do? You hang out with people normally just happens to be your age, uh, you know, maybe in the same uh, place in life that you have. You have you're, you're both married, you have you know, two kids, are about the same age, so they play. The ball field is like the creator of friendships, right? So why should we be friends? Because our kids are on the same team, so we're just going to be friends. And sometimes there's, there's marriage, and, and, and obviously it's important that you have something in common, and, and it's love. You should love each other. That's pretty important in marriage. So you love each other, and you can disagree on a few things. You can say, well, you know, hey, I made a huge mistake years ago. I married a Chevy girl, and I'm a Ford guy. But it's not important. You love each other. That should be more important. You know, you've seen the vehicles that drive by, and they have that tag on the front, house divided. You know, it's like, hey, here's one team on, the, on one side and the other one. And, and it's like, hey, it, get, it may get ugly one day a year, okay? But it's important that the rest of the, the time of the year you can... You love each other, and, and on that day as well. But it's okay. You can disagree on some things. You don't have to see eye to eye, but you have things in common. It's friendships. It's relationships. It's marriages. It's the church. It's the church. We, we disagree on some things, but, but we agree on other things. And, and what's important is not necessarily the number, but this is really where it comes into play. It's like, hey, you have to have something that's pretty, uh, pretty important that we have in common. We have to agree on one thing for sure, and that's Jesus. We, we say this is, it don't matter how many things, what tears us apart, or not even really topics, sometimes it's, it's just natural things. We, we come together from different races, different economic statuses, and we come from different parts of life. We come from, we have families that, that are, uh, come from divorced families, come from seemingly like perfect families. All these things, we, we come together, but why can we come together? Why can we have this common bond. It's Jesus. It's what he's done. This morning, we celebrate communion. We celebrate the Lord's Supper, and we think about this word, communion. It's this, this idea, it's this act of, of celebrating or, or, or exhibiting intimate feelings and thoughts and possessions. This is what communion means, this common bond that you have with somebody. And when it comes to this communion, specifically, this holy communion that we have, it's an expression of sharing what we have in common with each other because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. This is why it's called communion. We have something in common, and we wouldn't have that in common with God if it wasn't for Jesus. We wouldn't have that in common with God if it wasn't for grace and mercy that was poured out on the cross. So this morning, we celebrate this morning, we, we take an ordinance. It's important. It, it, it's not the end-all, be-all of our faith, but it's important. We, we have two ordinances. Most of you know them. It's, it's baptism. It's something we do one time. You, you, you come to faith in Christ, and you are baptized. And I'll, I'll plug right now, soapbox, it is so important that, that you follow in obedience. It's all this obedience. That you, you trust in Christ, you follow in baptism. Simply, His Word says it. And then we have something that we don't just do once, we do multiple times. It's, it's the Lord's Supper. And, and, of course, there's nowhere in Scripture that says this is how many times you need to have it. Some churches do it weekly. Some, like us, we do it quarterly. Maybe a little more than quarterly. Every once in a while. Maybe a little less sometimes. But, but it's important to do it. Maybe not how often, but we do it. And it's something that we do continuously. 
because it's a communion. It, it's something that brings our relationships together, that, that it's, it's founded on what Christ has done, and it's just a, a, a remembrance of what Christ has done. And if you have your Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I, I want to, again, do it just a, a little differently and, and touch on a few other things. And obviously what Paul is writing in the, to the church in Corinth, this is not good news that, that he's getting to. He's, 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 he's getting on to them. It's, it's time to, to talk to them. And it comes out of Matthew 26, what Christ has done before he goes to the cross. That, that he, he shares that last supper with his apostles. And, and he goes through it. And this is Paul's version of what's important. But let's start off in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. Paul writes, he says, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Now, I, I would hate for that to be something that, that someone said, someone we look up to, like the church here would, would look up to Paul and they would count on Paul and says, Paul, how do you feel about us? Well, he, he's written, you know, over 10 chapters at this point. Uh, he's writing a letter to them. They wouldn't see chapters and verse numbers or anything like that. It would just be a letter to them. And, and someone would read that out loud to the church. And they would get to that point and they would say, In the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. Verse 18, he says, In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have, been, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry. Another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or, you, do, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not, exclamation point. So this is not a, a happy portion of the letter that Paul is writing. And he's specifically talking about the Lord's Supper. He's specifically talking about how they take it. And, and we're not talking about details because we don't have the details. This is exactly how you should do it, how many times you should do it. But we know one thing for sure is that there is an attitude, attitude, a heart issue and how we take this. We, we celebrate literally, literally, what we're doing is celebrating the least selfish act in the history of mankind. God himself coming to earth, living for us, dying for us, proving that he's God, and prepared a way for us to have a communion with him. To have a relationship, have something in common with the creator of this universe. That's why we celebrate this. That's why we, we don't do it just once after we, we come to faith in Christ. We do it to remember what Christ has done for us. And there's a certain attitude. And Paul's saying, you've turned, basically, the, the, we go into detail, but basically it's this. Is that church you have, in the church of Corinth, ha have made the celebration of the least selfish act ever in the history of mankind, you've made it selfish. You've taken the most humble act, the most humble act in all of mankind, you've made it prideful. Let's not be that church. This is one of those times we look at Scripture and we see not necessarily what to do, we see what not to do. So here's what I want to do is when you get through uh, with, with verse 22, and, and, and of course in 23 is where we will come back to to have the Lord's Supper. Let's jump to, to verse 27 for a second. Paul writes, after he finishes the, the Lord's Supper scripture, he says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread, and drinks of the cup. For anyone who he eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. 
When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. We'll just stop there. This is what I want to do for just, just a moment. I want to take time, as I think we should, and examine ourselves. I, I want to take time, and, and, and what I mean by examine ourselves is, is to, to sit and to ask God, really, not just examine ourselves, but to ask God to show us our heart, to show us our attitude individually as, as, as people, every one of us, including myself, sinners. And what I want to do before we continue is have an opportunity for God to show us our heart, examine ourselves, for God to examine us and, and tell us, where, where should we ask for forgiveness? What's our, our attitude? When, when Paul's writing, it's in verse 27, and he says, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So there he's talking about the body and the blood of Jesus, which is represented in the Lord's Supper. But when he, when he continues in 29, he says, for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment of himself. There he's, he's actually talking about the church. And he's been talking about the church before this. And then in 12, he specifically talks about gifts and talents of the church and how we are the body of Christ. So what we should do is when we examine ourselves, ask God, God, how is my attitude with the body? What's my heart with other members? What's the attitude with other members in the church? Am I guilty of something? Reveal it to me. Reveal it to me so that way I can ask for forgiveness so we can mend relationships, not with just this body, not first, the body of Christ and its members. So what I want to do in complete silence, no, no playing or anything, is I, I just would ask everybody to bow their head for a second. For everybody to bow their head, let's take a moment to examine ourselves, our heart, and our attitude towards our relationships in the church, this church, the church, the body of of Christ. And after just a moment, I'll pray. Father, I pray that as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper and celebrate what you've done, God, I, we ask for forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness for our sins. Will we fail you, God? And I pray that you help us to mend relationships with each other. You help us to see where our sin is and, and act quickly, Father. Act quickly to do what's right, to not stall, Father. My own life, every life in this room, God, I pray that, that you prepare our hearts, Lord, to take this. You prepare our hearts to understand what this means, what your son Jesus has done for us and for our sins. You are good. Great is your faithfulness. You are so faithful, Lord, to continue to forgive us, continue to give us mercy, and love, Lord. This morning, I just pray, God, for what you're going to do in our hearts and for what you've already done. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, at this time, I'd ask the deacons to come up and prepare to serve the bread. This bread represents the body of Jesus, the body of, of Christ that's broken on our behalf. We have communion and we have a relationship with God because we have with not just a king, but the king. A relationship with the king of kings because of what Christ has done for us. And as we celebrated last week, celebrate even more than, than normal what, what he did on the cross for our sins. And this sacrifice had to be paid. No, no lamb could have done it for eternity. But the lamb, his body that was broken for our sins. In verse 23, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord 
but I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. God, we thank you again for what you've done, for preparing a way for us. Through your son Jesus, knowing from the beginning of creation, Lord, what had to be done, what would be done through him. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This juice represents the blood of Christ. And you see... The word covenant in Matthew, when Jesus is saying this is his new covenant, this is the New Testament, that that he would be our God and that we would be his children. And this is made possible because of the blood of Jesus. It's made possible because of the cross, the fact that, that we can belong to God and that he is our God as well. Paul continues to say in verse 25, he says, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for the the blood of your son, Jesus. We thank you for this time, God, as we just continue in service, Father, I pray that we just remember, as always, what you've done for us. In the name of Jesus, amen. greatest thing we can have in common with each other is Jesus. And we have that because of of what Christ has done. As we just conclude, as we begin invitation, if you don't know Christ, if you've never trusted in Him, then then I just wanted to tell you what what He did. What He did on the cross, what He did when He he rose from the grave, is that what He joined the the hands of heaven and earth. And and before Christ, they they knew God, and, and, and Hebrews says clearly they had faith. They, they believed in the Messiah that was to come. That, that's, he's coming, and, and we have faith, and they put their faith in God, and that was the right thing to do. And then Jesus came. The Messiah came, and many did believe. And what Jesus has done for us, for us, is that he joined the hands of the world with the hands of heaven, and he placed them together because of what he did on the cross, and that's what we celebrate. If you've never trusted in Christ, if you've never trusted in Christ, what that means is just realizing I, I'm a sinner and, and, and that you need Jesus, and it's only by what he did on the cross can we have it. It's the only, what he did on the cross is the only reason why we can have that communion, that relationship that's built on the greatest thing that we can have in common, Jesus Christ, and trust in him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for worship. As we just continued in worship, Lord, through what you've done, Father. And as we close, God, we have an invitation, Lord. We only pray that, that we're obedient to you. That's it. And for many, maybe that, that means that they've, they realize they have never placed their trust in Christ. They've, they've never said, they've never had a moment where they said they needed Jesus for salvation. 
Maybe they've been trying to work for it. Maybe, maybe they just thought they were raised in a Christian home, so they just somehow inherited their salvation from their parents. Well, your words clearly don't, we can't do that. Salvation has to be ours. And I pray, Lord, if there's anybody who, who knows that in their heart, Father, you, you've revealed it to them, God, that they need Jesus. They need to trust and pro- profess in front, of, in front of the world that they need Jesus. God, I pray this morning that you stir their hearts and you grab them in such a way that they choose Jesus this morning. They follow Christ this morning. They trust in what he's done on the cross for our sins. For, for believers, God, I pray that, that you use the Lord's Supper, you use a worship service, Father, to draw us closer to you. We really are never called to come into this place and leave the same way. We're always called to draw closer to you. And I pray that we did this morning. God, I pray that we continue to examine our life and our relationships, every relationship in our life. And they all have holes. They all have gaps. They all have mistakes. We're human. But I pray that we always look look to you for forgiveness and for guidance on how to mend those relationships so that we can continue to do this with a rightful heart and a rightful attitude. We love you. We thank you for what you've done for this morning. We pray for this time of invitation, Lord, for people to respond in the way that you desire. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together.